This podcast is powered by Pelotonia. To learn more about our goal to end cancer, visit pelotonia.org or see the link in the episode notes. Tell us about yourself. Who is Gabe? Yeah, so, I mean, Gabe is a uh, pretty interesting person. I guess I'm going to transition out of uh, third person. Yeah, now, but, <laughs> that was, we tried it. <laughs> um, I guess my involvement with Pelotonia sort of transitioned out of a moment um, that I fell into towards May of 2018 where I was experiencing some complications with my shoulder. So I go see this doctor and uh, I get an x-ray within like the first 30 minutes of seeing this doctor. Um, I went and reviewed it and they reviewed it and they're like, okay, yeah, there's something strange going on. They showed me the image and I like knew right away. Welcome to One Goal, a podcast from Pelotonia. We're a community that's dedicated to funding life-saving cancer research through a three-day experience of cycling and volunteerism. I'm your host and Ride Community Manager, Jill Landino. Your journey with us to the finish line begins now. Through research, we will see an end to cancer. Thankfully, every single penny raised through our riders, virtual riders, and volunteers goes directly towards the solution. This is made possible by our major funding partners, the Elburns Foundation, Huntington, the American Electric Power Foundation, and Peggy and Richard Santulli. It's because of them all of our partners in this dedicated community, that all of this is possible. If there's anything that describes 23-year-old Gabe Gemberling, it's the words joyful energy. Gabe radiates happiness. Through being Brutus and his own health journey, Gabe is very, very health conscious. In fact, before this conversation, he brought us a batch of vegetable juice he made in his own home juicer. Tasty, by the way. In total, his team Brutus Peloton has raised over $13,000 so far this year. And his writer profile says, I am personally committed to spending every waking moment actively being an ambassador for the James and for our community. Even when describing tough situations, there's a consistently positive tone in which it's said. So let's jump into Gabe's story. Right after his diagnosis in May of 2018, in this episode, The Cancer Coach. I definitely didn't talk to anybody about it. Um, so anyways, back to where I was at with the story. Um, so I'm with this doctor and he asked me to go get an MRI and I said, yeah, not a problem. So I go get an MRI. I go back and they talk to me again and they ask me if my parents can come down to Columbus for the day. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Like, that's awesome. Like, I can't wait to see my mom for sure. Like, Aww. I love my mom. My dad was unable to come because he was at work. Um, so I call my mom and of course, like the first thing she does, she's like, before she can even hang up the phone, she's probably already driving mm-hmm. to Columbus. Um, so she gets there. And we're at Panera, and they give me a call, and they're like, hey, uh, how are you doing? Can you come in to what would be um, the Jameson Crane Center, mm-hmm. which is the physical therapy yeah. place at Ohio State? Um, so I go there, and I'm sitting in this conference room, probably like 16 or so chairs at this table. Yeah. And, uh, and it's my, just you and your mom? It's my mom, myself, and uh, my girlfriend, Lexi. And then Jeff Dietz, who's the athletic trainer who oversaw my case, and um, Dr. Grant Jones, who... Um, is like one of the head athletic dra- or athletic doctors at Ohio State. He did, he sees oversees a lot of sports, but so uh, they kind of sit me down at this table and uh, they gave me the truth. And what was happening was there was a malignant tumor growing off of my right humerus. So at that kind of moment, it was like, oh my gosh, like what? That no, that can't be right. Not me. Like no way. Um, so I I looked to my mom and I looked to my girlfriend and uh, they were both pretty frustrated. And I wasn't really responding, um, par- partially probably because I was in shock. Yeah. Um, but I remember getting up and walking around the table, and I was just, like, lapping this table over yeah. and over again to the point where they're like, Gabe, you need to sit down. So, I mean, I have a lot of energy as it is, so having nervous energy on top of that, you know, compiled into just me kind of going wild. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so that's when things kind of hit the wall, and uh, they they conferenced in my doctor at the time, which was, well, Thomas Sharschmet. I told you earlier is the man, the myth, the legend. Um, he's just the most phenomenal human being of all time. And uh, there's a biography on my case online. And it says online that I hated him when I first met him, which isn't true. I want to clarify that right now. I love him. <laughs> you dearly. heard it here. I do. If you're listening, I love you. <laughs> but uh, what was the, the issue was I didn't like that I was talking to an oncologist um, so looking back on it, it was like, I don't want to like, talk to this guy, you know, yeah. like I shouldn't be put in this position. Like, why, why do I have to do this? So I think that kind of stemmed where I said, so whoever quoted me and said that I hated him, 
I, the, I, I redact that. The comment. facts were false. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's so true. Do you remember what they told you in that first meeting when you were pacing or? or yeah. Did? I mean, so I think a lot of times, like when I look back on my experience, it was a lot, but I think a lot of like the pain that I have oftentimes comes from guilt. Um, just purely out of the fact is like when you go through life and you're so young, you kind of overlook cancer. You never imagine yourself having it. Um, but even when you look at adults who have cancer, you kind of just like almost want to put your head down. Cause you're like, I can't imagine myself in that position. Like, I don't want to look at it. Like, like if I ignore it, it won't happen to me type yeah. thing. Um, so I think that that's where I kind of fell at at that point was like, okay, I've ignored this happening and now it's me. Um, so I do remember them telling me, I guess what I'm going for is I was a little bit confused on the diagnosis and this is going to sound funny to you. So, um, they sat me down and they said, uh, it's a tumor and, uh, it is malignant. And I remember I looked at my girlfriend and I thought malignant. I was like, wait, I was like, is that the good Good one? (laughs) Is that benign? Is malignant benign? Like I was so naive at that point. I knew nothing about it. Like, well, I guess why should I have ever known that? I was never like in the science field or anything. So I remember it taking a little bit of time for me to register. I was like, oh, that's the bad one. Yeah. Like, you don't want to be malignant, Uh-oh. game. Yeah. Um, so I remember my girlfriend, like, falling into tears and stuff. And I, ap- I should apologize to her public right now. I looked over. I was like, I'm going to need you to stop crying because we can't, like, we're not going to go into this without a positive attitude. It was, it was definitely a challenging time, and it's a moment I'll never forget, I mean, ever for the rest of eternity. But... Um, I think that it's a moment that now looking back on it, it sounds crazy, but like, thank God it happened to me. Um, so when I talked about the athletic department and all that kind of stuff, like how I was able to be scheduled for an MRI and the x-ray in the same day, it's kind of unheard of for yeah. a, you know, a cancer patient. Um, so that's something that I was super gracious for um, was the speed of it. Um, so that's one thing that I definitely think is like an I guess a repeating theme is like, thank God it happened to me because I had, you know, all of these sort of, um, I guess, assets that I could utilize when yeah. another person isn't going to. So um, I was definitely thankful for that. I think I think I f- it fell into the right person's hands. Well, that's not, I think, something that you hear a lot of people say that, thank goodness. Yeah, exactly. It was me. But exactly. you have such a strong support system. You had for a lot sure. of great resources. Um so that day, you know, your mom, Lexi, you, you leave the office. Yeah. What kind of happens after that? I mean, do you, yeah. do you drive? Do you sit? Do we you- drove. Um, it's so, I'm so glad you're asking these questions because it's all so vivid and it's easy to speak on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we hopped in the car and uh, I kind of took over control of the situation where I was so stubborn at first and I was like, I'm not even going to learn the name of my cancer because I'm going to beat it before I even have to learn the name. Um, so obviously that's not true. Now I, I clearly know the you name. It's it. like yeah. my life. And the name of the type of cancer so that you had. So the type of cancer that I had was osteosarcoma, um, which is a form of bone cancer that usually happens in adolescence up into somewhere in late 20s. Um, it's kind of the cutoff isn't really exact, but um, so I fell right into that age bracket where, you know, this would be happening. And I remember when I was on the phone um, with my oncologist, Thomas Scharschmidt, for the first time, he was like, if you're going to have cancer, this is the cancer you want to have. And I was like, or not having it, like, that would be good too. <laughs> the good thing about osteosarcoma is, for the most part is um, if they're not metastasizing, they're usually centralized somewhere. So mine was centralized directly in my arm where um, operational wise, it was a little easier to get to. Um, and I guess I should go off that. It always, I shouldn't say always, but nine times out of 10, it's going to usually happen on an appendage. So um, an arm, a leg, usually in the, in pocket regions. So mine was in my shoulder, a hip, a knee, um, those sorts of things. So a little fun fact for you, but I told you this also last Saturday. So sarcoma is in general, um, whether if it's rhabdomyosarcoma, osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, um, it only makes up for 1% of cancer diagnoses in the world. Um, And only 800 people in the United States are diagnosed with osteosarcoma. I remember I organized like a uh, conference with my family (laughs) where I invited everybody over to my mom's house. Wow. Um, And when was that going to be? That was going to be the night of. Um, So we drove home two hours back to Canton, Ohio, and we get in the kitchen and we conference call my brother and his wife who live in California, the one I was visiting um, just shortly before. 
and we're all in the kitchen. We're all having a good time. And I think everybody's equally as confused. Like, oh, what's going on here? Yeah. Like, my mom's not making food, so we're not getting fed, which yeah. is strange. So um, I stood up, and uh, my arms were crossed, and I just said, hey, uh, they diagnosed me with cancer today, and I'm not going to learn the name of it, <laughs> so I can't tell you what it is. Um, but then, of course, my mom filled in the blanks for me, and she said, you know, it's osteosarcoma. Um, and this is kind of where we're going from here. Wanted to be really, uh, I guess, personal about it at the beginning. I wasn't quite sure who I wanted to share that with just because it's a lot of people to take on. Um, like even if it's distant family, friends, like people have their own things that they need to worry about. Like I didn't want a lot of people worrying about me at the time. Uh, so I kept it inside my family for quite a while. Uh, and then like a week later, I saw one of our great family friends. I call her an aunt, but, um, she's really, she's a great family friend, uh, at Lowe's. And she was like, hey, how are you doing, Gabe? And immediately I was like, I got diagnosed with cancer. <laughs> <laughs> Just come right out with it. So, but yeah. I think that th- that was a good thing for me, though, because I was re- I was ready to talk about it. Like, I didn't want to hide it anymore. Like, I wanted people to know. And, like, I wanted to start building an awareness. Like, I wanted to use what I had and, you know, show people, like, be cognizant of what's going on in your body. Like, if it's happening to me, I'm a, like, I was f- a very healthy person. I mean, the juice alone explains how healthy I am. I mean, he brought us um, some homemade juice today because yeah. he knew we have had a long day and we could use it, which it was phenomenal. Yeah. So, how do you feel? Does your body feel I jacked could, up I right now? I could go be Brutus and do a I believe it. right now. I, I think. Know. Yeah. That, that's pretty much all you have to do to be Brutus is just, just drink juice. Chug some juice. Yeah. Exactly. I had the MRI, I had my x ray, I had a PET scan, um, CAT scan, uh, biopsy, all that good stuff. And had my surgery, I think, three days after that. So things were happening really quickly. Like, I couldn't even blink before I was having the next appointment or the next surgery. Um, So I had my surgery, and things were looking great. Um, We sent my tumor to a couple different hospitals across the United States. And I think it finally ended up in New York. They discovered that part of it was still malignant or something along the lines of this. I'm still learning. (laughs) Um... So I went in to see Dr. Sharshman, and I'm pumped because I love him. So he's great. And I'm super excited. He walks in the dorm, like, how's it going? He's like, you look great, you know, like all this stuff. So it's probably three weeks after my surgery. He's like, yeah, so um, I got, you know, your results back from all the screening and everything. And uh, we're going to have another surgery on Thursday. And it's Tuesday. Let's do this. <laughs> I was like, let's go. Like, all right, sweet. I mean, if it's going to happen, let's make it happen faster. So I knew the faster That was your reaction. Yeah, it actually was. My mom and girlfriend were in the room, too. So they could attest to this, but they were both super emotional again. And, uh, you know, we went back to Canton, and we spent, like, I don't know, 15, 20 hours in Canton. And then we drove back to Columbus, and we were wheels up, ready to roll in the surgery room. It sounds funny to say, like, a good time going into surgery, but I loved the staff at the James so much that I was honestly excited to be with them. Like, I knew the nurses on, like, floors I was being operated on and I knew how much they loved me I knew how much I loved them so when I got to see them obviously the reasons I was getting to see them weren't awesome but being around them in itself was super fun for me so it was always it was always a good time and I think it was really important for me to rather than freak out to not know what you're expecting um, in surgery to you know kind of just ease yourself out and enjoy the situation that you were in before you went down so I definitely did that but they've always told me like a couple times when I was going into surgery and my biopsy when I was still like half awake, I'd always tell them like, I'm Brutus. If you didn't know, (laughs) (laughs) I'm I'm Brutus Boca. So I don't consciously remember. You guys heard of me? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't know, even know what the response was. I hope it was awesome. Like I hope they were equally as excited as I was to tell them as they were to hear it. I think it was. So you had another successful surgery, but a friend of yours was in a very similar situation. Tell us that story. Jeremy comes over, and he has to talk. And I said, absolutely, love if you would come over. So we get to chatting, and Jeremy tells me that he was diagnosed with rhabdomyosarcoma, which is a cancer, a sarcoma cancer, the same taxonomy. Um, his is located in his stomach, though. And his is a soft tissue cancer. So he tells me this diagnosis, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, like I said earlier in the podcast, 1% of people – are being diagnosed with sarcoma in the United States, 800 people a year, less than point, I don't know, zero one percent of Ohio State graduates have been Brutus Buckeye. How do two people have sarcoma who have been Brutus? That doesn't make sense to me. Even weirder, 
His girlfriend's name is Lexi. My girlfriend's name's Lexi. Even weirder, they're both cheerleaders at Ohio State. No, oh, you're kidding. I'm not. Which is also probably 0.1%. Exactly. Of, yeah. So what I'm getting to is don't date girls named Lexi. No, I'm just <laughs> Jeremy and I both dearly love no, our but girlfriends. The, but I mean, the oddities of that happening are insane. So I assume that you were a great resource for him as he was going through. Yeah, I was I was the cancer coach. You were the cancer coach. I was the cancer Is coach. Is that what you named yourself? Yeah. <laughs> Not official, just now. <laughs> um, but I remember when he told me, I was sitting on my floor, and Jeremy and I are the same where a lot of our life, we've spent time taking care of each other, and we don't like it to be returned to us. Um, and I told him right then and there, right when he said it, I said, Jeremy, you're going to have to let people love you a lot. <laughs> I know that's going to be hard for you, but that's going to be the first step. And I knew that that was what he was going to struggle with the most. That dude, he could take on whatever treatment they were going to throw at him, like whatever surgery they were going to throw at him. It didn't matter. But I knew that from the moment he told me that he was going to need to be able to let people love him into his life. So that was that was the beginning of my cancer coaching. I didn't have a whistle at that point for my coaching, but... It's coming. How did you guys come to terms with all of this? We've came to terms by trying to tackle cancer. Um, That's why we started the Brutus Peloton team, um, or Brutus Peloton, where it's consisted, I like to say, of everybody who loves Ohio State and hates cancer, which is, I feel like, you know, probably 90% of people in Ohio. Um, But yeah, we did like a little spin off of Peloton. It was the greatest team ever. We just did the most spirited team ever. So. I mean, we are. That's what we you are. That's what we want to embody. We want to embody what Brutus means to the community and what Pelotani means to the community. And I think both of those um, symbolize a, just generally good things. Um, so we want to take what we had with Brutus and the platform we had with the university and invite anybody and everybody onto our Peloton. And uh, that's, I think, a first step or an instrumental step in you know, bringing an end to cancer. And Jeremy and I, I guess, feeling more comfortable in ourselves with this diagnosis and dealing with it in terms of why this 1% and why our girlfriends and why they have to cheerlead and be called Lexi, you know, like all of those things all come into fruition of us wanting to have this, you know, team that's going to come together to the same reason that the rest of the Pelotons are coming together, which is the end cancer once and for all. At this point, you've already had two surgeries. Where are you on your journey? I'm done. I'm still in a sling at this point. Yeah. I'm telling him now what we have at the James. Like, it wasn't even me helping him. It was him having this diagnosis, still kind of being up in the air. I mean, he's not really seeing a lot of doctors. To me, being like, okay, Jeremy, like, we have this awesome hospital that is feet from where we're at right now. Like, let's make sure we take care of that. And I think one thing that I've always talked to Jeremy about, too, when he was making this decision of him and where what hospital he was going to go for treatment and all this good stuff, was how great he felt when he walked into the James Um, being surrounded by all the Ohio State stuff which sounds a little silly but um, you know going there and being a graduate of Ohio State you know and seeing a a Buckeye leaf on the ground and seeing Brutus right there like your support system is pretty inexplainable at that point where you know you're going to have everything that you need there and you're going to feel comfortable with where you're at Um, and then obviously like I tell people the architecture of the James is it's just unbelievable I could go and I could sit in the lobby and just take in the natural sunlight for hours. So you and your friend Jeremy are doing well. You're getting excited. And this Peloton is taking off. Who all is on the team this year? So right now we have, the, obviously everybody's a little growing accustomed to, you know, joining Pelotonia and all this stuff and what it entails. So I have to walk like my mom, my dad, my aunt, my uncle, my cousins, all through this process and my brothers of signing up, like where you want to volunteer. Do you want to be a virtual rider? Do you want to be a rider? All that good stuff. So um, it's slowly coming into fruition, but it's just so electric, honestly. Like, that's the best way I can describe it. It's just electric. The one thing that I stress to people the most, and I said this earlier, is how it's real dollars. Like, you hear these numbers, like, f- for example, at Buckeye Thon this year. We danced all day. We had a great time. And they released the number. And it's, I think it was $1.7 million. And you're like, wow, $1.7 million? That's crazy. If you think about $1.7 million and a $100 bill sitting on your bed, like it's going to stack up to the ceiling, you know? So I think that for me, when I tell people, rather than, than them making a donation and not really knowing where their money goes, um, is what I try to avoid the most or encourage people to see is that 
you're going to see where your money's going to go because I'm a living I'm living proof of this. Of course, you're riding this year and being the cancer coach. Are you coaching your team on anything? Uh, and what are you looking forward to during the ride? Um, I mean, I f- everybody's going to be nervous to have sore legs, but I mean, it's inevitable it's going to happen. So I remember having a checkup with my doctor after he rode Char Schmidt and him like gimping into the room. I was like, wow, maybe I'm not going to ride next year or maybe I'm not going to ride 100. Um, so I think the thing I'm most looking forward to is having that sense of community involvement. Um, like everybody I've talked to, obviously everybody says like how great it is, how much they love the ride, but everybody always thrives about the support that they have on the ride and like the people lined on the street supporting you. And I think that is going to be the coolest part because I mean, not everybody's going to know I'm a survivor and that doesn't really matter, but everybody's there. It doesn't matter if you're a survivor. It doesn't matter what your, your impact is or what your relationship is with cancer. People are there because they care about our community. Gabe, what would you say to anybody who's on the fence about riding? If they're on the fence, I think one, identify the fear of why you're on the fence. Um, so I think a lot of different things come into that, whether if it's, I'm not sure if I'm going to be available that weekend, or I'm not sure if I can meet my fundraising goals, or something along the lines of that. I think that if you can identify it, there's definitely resources that Pelotonia has that can get you to a point where you're fully committed. So, I mean, if the weekend's not free, you have a wedding, totally understandable. Um, but that doesn't mean that on a Friday night that you can't go to, you know, the, the send-off event or anything like that. Like, there's always ways to get involved. And I talked about just being there to support somebody. Like, being there to support somebody in itself is just as impactful as being a volunteer. Like, you're still volunteering your time to support people and cheer people on. Like, and that's awesome, too. So... Um, but like one resources that I, I didn't know I had um, through Pelotonia and I later discovered just from starting a Peloton was like fun sharing. So when I talk to people about how if they want to ride and how they can go about riding and their first responses will ha- usually how much money do I need to fundraise? And I always tell them, you know, it depends on how long you want to ride and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I tell them, you know, we have things set in place where we can support you if you're not going to reach your fundraising goals. Like, We have all these awesome things through being a subcategory of Team Buckeye that, you know, you can sell raffle tickets um, to Ohio State games and things like that. Like, there's easy ways to reach your fundraising goals. And if you can't make it, we can help you get there. But there's so many different resources within Peloton and within the Pelotons and just community, like, companies in the community that will assist you in getting there. So anybody who's on the fence, you got to jump over that fence ASAP because I, I feel like... When I go through life's moments and I do it, I just can't thank myself enough. I want to say this. The future you will thank you. Um, but I think that like my positivity, I don't know if it comes by naturally because I've gone through events in my life where like I could have shut down. Like, I could have just gave up. Like, even from when I was younger, like even if it was a divorce or like a fight or anything like that or a broken relationship, like I could have just been like, okay, yeah, whatever. Like I'm just going to do my own thing. Um, but that was just never in my nature, really. Uh, I I have a, I guess, a non-official mentorship um, with one of my instructors. His name's Phil Sutton. He's a biker. He's uh, he's biking Pelotonia this year for the first time, so he's super excited about it. Um, but I always talk to him, and I tell him that there's a lot of things in life that people can't control, and there's a lot of things that go on in the world that aren't particularly right, that don't sit well with me, I guess, so... Um, he's an evangelist and I told him like, I'm going to make, I'm going to attempt to make the world as close to heaven for people as it possibly can. Um, and I think that the best way for me to do that is just to spread positivity. Um, and it sounds kind of cliche, but I think I really do believe that. Like if I'm going to have this gift to be happy and like do all this fun stuff and get people involved, I mean, let's, let's do it and make it fun and, you know, make the world as good as we possibly can while we can with what we have. So quick update on our friend Gabe. Everything is still looking good, and he graduated from Ohio State in early May. However, he didn't make it to graduation. He was on top of Mount Rainier in Washington State celebrating his survivorship. If it wasn't evident through Gabe's words in our last episode, every single moment that he spends with us or with anybody else he knows, uh, he's got a smile on his face, he's energized, he's lit up, he's moving around a ton. I mean, he's just a ball of energy um, and truly one of the most engaging uh, and nice 
people that I have ever met, I think, in my entire life. Um, I had the pleasure of driving up to a fundraiser in Lima, Ohio, uh, with Gabe earlier this year. Uh, He had a great time addressing the crowd, getting everybody really pumped up uh, to raise funds. And that was uh, a really monumental night for for that Peloton up in Lima. And um, to get to meet Gabe and hear more about his story was just unforgettable for them. We want to say thank you to our major funding partners for making this podcast and everything we do in the Pelotonia world possible. So thanks to the Alberance Foundation, Huntington, the American Electric Power Foundation, and Richard and Peggy Santulli. Even outside of Ride Weekend, the Pelotonia community is dedicated year-round to raising funds. At the end of each podcast, we're excited to share with you a really fun example from our community of creative and passionate fundraisers on how they've gotten their friends and family excited to donate to their efforts every year. So our Ride Community Coordinator, Olivia, hears really fun stories all year round about what our community is up to. But I always like to think about the fact that so many people like to ride, but it doesn't always have to be ride weekend. The first weekend in August in Columbus is a beautiful time to to visit us, but not everybody can make it. So, Olivia, what are some creative examples of ways that people have created their own rides? So, yes, Jill, there are people that can't make it to ride weekend. And there are also people that aren't able to be a part of ride weekend because they're not old enough yet. And ride. how old do you have to be to ride in Pelotonia? 14. 14. And we have a friend, Jack Hamburger, who was 13 when he decided to do something a little bit different with his experience that year. And uh, since he wasn't of age to be participate in the ride with the rest of his family, who were very involved, he decided to spend his entire spring break that whole week riding each day in honor of his grandma. And he set a goal to raise... Two thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and ride a hundred miles, and he did a hundred and one. He did a hundred. He did one extra mile. Did the extra mile. I love that. Did the extra mile in honor of his grandma, and he just really shows the drive to be involved at a young age. And we truly can't wait till he's fourteen to actually be out there with us on ride weekend. Yeah, and we should mention that uh, he was joined by his dad. Um, Tim Hamburger, who is an 11-time writer, an incredible advocate uh, for cancer research and really helps so many people train throughout the community. Um, and his other brother, Luke, has been really involved. So just overall, their family's incredible. Um, so they did a ride in the U.S. outside of Ride Weekend, but there's some folks who have ridden outside these 50 states. So a yeah. little bit more about that. Yeah, we have a group uh, with Cardinal Health. They have an international organization. And this group rode in Thailand. And they sent us pictures of their jerseys. Uh, They had videos of their routes. And we're just sharing their experience because they couldn't fly into town and make it on Ride Weekend, which was really fun to see them get involved. There's also a group with L Brands that participate from Shanghai. In China. In China. I love that. Same thing. Sending pictures of their jerseys and their ride and just engaging their colleagues out in other parts of the world. If you are listening to this and you can't make it to Columbus the first weekend in August every year, that is A-OK. We'll help you put together a ride outside in your neighborhood. You can invite your friends and your family and have a great time. Thanks so much for sharing, Olivia. We'll keep listening for a preview of our next episode. In one of my last conversations I ever had with her, she pulled me down and she made us promise her. She said, never use my death as an excuse for anything, but motivation for everything. You've been listening to One Goal, a podcast from Pelotonia, hosted by me, Ride Community Manager Jill Landino, with interview production and scheduling by Marketing Communications Manager Emily Smith. Produced, mixed, and sound designed at the studios of Wessler Media by Vince Tornero. Additional mastering by Joey Gerwin at Oren Judio. Special thank you to all of our guests for being so open and willing to share their stories. Please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast, as that will help others hear these empowering stories. If you're curious about joining the Peloton community and making an impact on cancer research, please see the link in the episode notes or visit pelotonia.org. That's pelotonia.org.